Okay, well, it's now my very great pleasure um, to hand things over to um, a very uh, dear friend of ours, of mine. I know a lot of you are big fans too. Uh, Nicole Turner Lee, uh, who recently joined the Brookings Institute. So thank you so much for coming from that august organization to be with us today. And Kevin Clark, professor and children's media consultant at George Mason University, who will be talking about your latest research. So I hand it over to you, Nicole. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> I always love coming to Fosse. Thank you, Stephen, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we have a limited window of time, so people who do know me know that I talk a whole lot. <laughs> so I'm actually going to work on not being that verbose today so that Kevin can actually talk about his research. Um, Kevin Clark is a professor over at George Mason University and the director of the Digital Media Learning Lab, or Learning Center, he'll clarify. He's been a dear friend. I've known him for over 15 years, um, even though I was in elementary school when I met him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but one thing about Kevin that I have to say with this new bucket of research is that his commitment to really analyzing and understanding uh, the dynamics of niche-based audiences really has come through in this particular research that we're going to talk about. Um, some of you who do know me know when I came to Washington, D.C., one of the first studies that I actually did was a stratified sample of African Americans and Latinos when it came to broadband adoption and use. It was the first empirical study that actually looked at an over-stratified sample um, after talking with my dear friend Lee Rainey about why we weren't getting enough data on African Americans and Latinos at the time. So I've always been curious as a sociologist in how do we actually look at how particular communities are using technology. And that's a particularly curious question today because those of us who have been in this room know that the digital divide, even though it is narrowing in terms of people's access to the internet, people of color, disabled people, older Americans, um, rural residents are still disproportionately represented. In fact, Pew continues to say that they're at a 13% level when it comes to digital access. So what you've done, Kevin, is really interesting because you came back and sort of flipped the script on this whole conversation. And instead of looking at the glass half empty, what Dr. Clark has done is really look at how individual African-American households, particularly young people, are using technology, which is important for people that in this, in this room that are following these issues through um, FOSSI, but also looking at uh, trends of broadband adoption. It helps us get to the granularity of the right. problem because we can't figure it out <laughs> without the right kind of data. So Kevin, I want to open it up to you, just some general thoughts and reasons why you decided to embark on this type of study for the audience, and then we'll get to some granular questions. So first, I'll say that this wasn't just me. Um, this was a study that um, my colleague, Kim Scott, who's at Arizona State, um, and I put, um, came up with the idea and we wrote the grant. It was uh, graciously funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates um, Foundation. And then we reached out to um, one of the top research consultants in this field, and that's Vicki Rideout. And she, the three of us then, worked on putting together this study. The, the rationale behind it was all of the studies that we had seen up to this point that looked at issues of media usage only had African Americans as a small component of a larger sample. And so it was really hard to get granular and to really paint a full picture of African Americans. And so um, this study, we surveyed over 1,000, actually 1,041 dyads. So that means we had a teen, 11 to 17, and a parent. So we ended up with about with 2,000 um, 82 uh, subjects. And we wanted to also look at the complexities of what happens in a home so that technology doesn't just exist in isolation. And so we wanted to, to begin to quantify and get at some of those um, questions. Last thing I'll say um, b before I throw it back to you, and that is we used three data points or three uh, data types. One was a traditional survey. Uh, two was uh, focus groups. We went to five cities around the country. Um, one of them was, was the rural delta, Mississippi, and then the, and the others were urban and suburban. And then the third component of the study w were um, digital stories. 
we had the people who participated in those focus groups, we pulled a subset of them and had them create their own digital stories. Because often, as researchers, we collect the data and we use the data to tell their story. But we wanted the participants to actually tell their own story. So we're really excited about it. No, I mean, that sounds actually was a robust research methodology. So that's why I think the data is so rich. And for those of you that don't know the title, it's the Digital Lives of African American Tweens, Teens, and Parents, Innovating and Learning with Technology. And I can really you know, identify with that because I have a teen and a tween <laughs> that keep me up. So I completely understand. So talk to us a little bit about this finding of smartphone use. So we have found out from the Pew Research Center that smartphone adoption among historically disadvantaged groups is at a, the highest peak when it comes to other groups. In your study, you found that smartphones was the on-ramp for youth. Right. Um, and give us a little background on why was that, and if you actually project that that's going to be the case in the future. Well, it's, what's interesting about smartphone usage is that, yes, it's a high adoption number. It's you know in the 80 percent. But what is interesting is that part of the reason that that we assume that it's that way is because smartphones go with you no matter what environment you're in, right? So a, a, a youth or a child exists in three environments: home, school, and community. And so even with these one laptop initiatives, right? You go to school, you get your nice shiny laptop, but you can only use it in school. And then maybe when you get home, you can use it there. But what happens between home and school? And so what we see around smartphone usage is that young people aren't in discrete places, right? They are fluid across all of these environments. So we went to one of our focus groups in Chicago. We talked to a young lady, and she talked about her day. It took her an hour and a half to get to commute to school. And so for her, the smartphone was not only the lifeline for communication, but it was also the way she got her homework done during that time. When you think about other devices, you can't really do that with a laptop. You can't really do that with um, a tablet unless you have consistent, reliable broadband, which in a lot of instances, you don't. Mm -hmm. And so um, smartphone usage was the, by far the highest in terms of adoption, but a close second were computers. Because one of the things that, young, that uh, young people told us is, yes, I may write notes, and I may use my smartphone to help get my paper started. But at the end of the day, I want to sit down at a computer and type the whole essay out. I don't want to have to you know, sit down and do it all on a smartphone. And so computers, and, and this was a surprise to us, computers were actually second in terms of uh, preferred devices for that reason, that they were more robust, you could do more, um, they had more um, computing power. No, and that's interesting, too, because for those of us who have followed, uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel, right, talks about the homework gap. But one of the areas that consistently comes up is the limitations of having a smartphone and whether or not you can write a research paper on a smartphone. But your research is actually showing sort of a hybrid model, right? Kids have what they have in their pockets, but they also know how to leverage other devices, which is a different finding for many of us in the policy space. You know, you also find in the study, which I found to be interesting, gender disparities, right? And as you said, you've partnered with uh, Dr. Scott at the Center for Gender Equity in STEM at Arizona State University, who's focused on improving outcomes for women and girls of color. What did that look like? And why are we still having the same conversation about girls not adopting technology? Well, you know, what, what's interesting is that some of the gender um, issues or results, findings, were a surprise and some of them were not. So for example, when you look at adoption of, of the three types of technology that, that we asked about, which were um, smartphones, computers, and tablets, um, young girls are, have, have them more than boys. They've adopted them. The, the percentages are higher for, for girls than boys. But what's interesting is that when you then go to the parents and you say, do you encourage your daughter to um, be adventurous on the internet, do you encourage her to go out and do things? You see a disparity, right? Because we don't want our daughters out there looking because we know that it's a bad place and they're bad people. And so what was really interesting is that when you look at it regionally, mm -hmm. so we had people tell us um, when they did the survey, they told us where they were from. In the South, 60% 
of the parents surveyed said they discouraged their daughters as opposed to about 30%. So it was almost twice as much. But girls actually have the technology. Mm -hmm. And so there's this, there's this you know, dichotomy that we're dealing with that, yes, we think they should have it, but you can't go but so many places. You yeah. can't go but so far. And so that was for us one of the large things. The third thing was um, coding. And this was, um, when you look at interest, interest for youth in coding, um, the smallest difference between boys and girls is right when they're tweens, right at 11 to 12 years old. There's only a five point difference. Uh, boys are much more interested, or are more interested than, than girls, only by five points. When you start getting older, so now when you go to 13, 14, 15, you see a drastic drop off, a significant difference, right? there's almost 11% initially. And so what that tells us is from a policy standpoint is that if we want to get more girls interested in STEM, we need to do it early. It needs to happen when they're 9, 10, 11. Don't wait until they're 15 and say, oh, we're going to have a STEM camp. It's too late mm -hmm. because they've already either checked out or, or found other things to do. I, I guess I'm doing something right. My 10-year-old's in a Pokemon Go class at school, <laughs> and that took me a long time to figure out why she wanted to do that. <laughs> I'm the only girl, but you're right, right? We've got to figure out ways to actually engage them, which is interesting because I think if any of us close our eyes, right, these trends are probably uh, not just specific to African-American households. They're probably across the board when we look at the amount of women that are actually involved in this area, but even more so the trust factor, which actually gets to my next question. One of the findings that you actually uh, lay out in the paper, which I found to be really interesting, is this uh, departure from informal learning environments. So I used to work for a group called One Economy Corporation where we tried to cultivate local learning environments in historically underserved neighborhoods to teach each other about technology. Because we felt like people coming from the outside teaching people about technology was a deterrent. What yours found in your report is that formal learning environments for digital literacy matter yes. in African American yeah. communities. Yeah. You know, why? So when we asked the question, where are you learning about technology and computing, 76% uh, of the youth surveyed said in a school, yeah. in a formalized setting. Um, what was interesting about that question is that when we then disaggregated the data based on income, uh, youth from low-income households were less likely to learn about technology from someone immediately yeah. around them. And so what that tells you is that the community that you live in actually matters. And there's this ecosystem, right? So when we talk about all of the tech billionaires and all of these people who are making money off of tech and, and doing great things off of tech, if we dig deeper, what we will find is that they have an ecosystem. They got an uncle who knows how to, how to put together a computer. They have an aunt who can give them suggestions on where, where to go during the summer to get an internship. When you're a low, if you're a youth from a low income household, you don't have access to those people. And so what happens is you go from school to home, and imagine going from school to home, and, and I tell you, turn off your phone. When you get home, turn it off. It's like that, mm -hmm. right? Because who do you ask? Mm -hmm. Who do you go to? What resources do you have? And so for us, from a policy standpoint, again, this tells us that when we do funding or when we look at efforts to fund um, youth STEM or, or, or technology initiatives for young people, we also need to include parents and caregivers and communities. And it doesn't need, we don't need to have parent boot camps, right? We don't need to have parent coding academies, but what we do need to have are, are opportunities for parents to know how to be supportive. I always give the example, both I have a 13-year-old daughter and a 15, uh, he's 17 now, 17-year-old son. They both took piano lessons. I have no idea how to play the piano, but I, what I do know how to do is say, that didn't sound right, play it again. <laughs> One more time, right? Because the piano instructor said, look, you don't know nothing about this, but here's what I want you to do. Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to figure out ways to get parents and caregivers involved in the technology opportunities that young people are involved in. 
You know, it's so interesting because it speaks to, I think President Obama today uh, put out an initiative around tech inclusivity, right? Um, because we're finding, and, and some of you can go back to that Fast Company article which said that tech entrepreneurship a couple years ago gets done in the Silicon Valley, and a response to that by an African-American commentator was like, well, what about Silicon Alley, right? Because that's where we also have to make sure there are opportunities for young kids of color to actually get into these, you know, these uh, pl places that you're talking about. So that isolation is real. Right? And if that isolation is real, it keeps the kid within that same circumstance. So it's important, and I promise Kevin I was not getting into the election because it's not this panel, but it's important that we see policies and funding that sustain, because like you said, you have kids that are barren. They're in, they're in right. digital deserts, right? right? Which I think impacts the rest of uh, what Steve is interested in, and all of us are interested in getting those kids resources that integrates them into the ecosystem. And, and one of the things that the study highlighted was this notion of, um, we assume sometimes that young people, particularly African American youth, they're not interested, they don't want to do this, right. they don't have the skills, they don't have the confidence. This report showed the absolute opposite. They have the confidence, they have the desire. And so what we see is that most of them have done all of the simple things. They've created presentations, they've modified photographs, they've done all of these things that are kind of basic or 101. What they really want to do are the more advanced skills. They want to build an app. They want to create a website. They want to create an online business. They want to modify a video game. And that is where we see the lack of opportunity. We don't see programs that, in, in, in mass, that allow African American youth to take advantage of those advanced skills. We do see a lot of programs that kind of introduce them or expose them to, to those skills. Yeah, and it takes it to another level, which reminds me while we're here at Fossey, like, is it because, and I have one more question before we run out of time, um, is it because privacy is an issue? Like, how is it parents learning from the kids, the fact that they don't know? Is it the privacy factor? You know, you mentioned it with girls, but what is that limiting factor on the part of the parental environment to actually move kids forward on this? Well, I think part of it is, is parents don't um, get the full scope of the activity or opportunities that young people would be involved in. So I ran a game design program for seven years. We taught um, young people how to build um, educational games in Washington, D.C. And the parents would come up to me and say, I need, can you help me figure out how to get my child to stop playing so many games at home? And I thought, I'm teaching your child how to build games. They should be playing games. And they said, well, it's a waste of time because this, this, this isn't going to lead anywhere. And so I realized I needed to really have a class for parents to tell them about the business of video games. And once they realized that this is a career and this can be a college major, they were very supportive. They were in, enrolling their kids in all kind of game, you know, programs. But I think that's the key, is helping parents figure out how they can be helpful and how they can be supportive. Hey, look, like my pastor says, if you can't say men, say ouch. I was an ouch person. <laughs> Get off that phone, right? Because my kids were using games. It was just ridiculous. But now, you know, I have a son that is actually going into video game design. So I completely get it now. You know, one last thing I want to actually touch on your research, um, and I think this is a pertinent conversation given this time, mm -hmm. right, is there's a finding in the research around the exposure of African-American kids to racist and or sexist uh, comments mm -hmm. or content, content, which I find to be interesting because we haven't really seen, you know, these kind of studies dig deeper into the extent of content and how that affects young people. What was it about that finding that uh, made it significant as a researcher? And given the fact that you know we've seen this increase in some racial violence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, what do we do about it? And, and how do we as policymakers, given the fact that we're concerned with the whole child, kind of negotiate through the availability of this content on the web? Yeah, that was one of the most troubling findings. And that is that we asked the question of, about exposure to disrespectful or negative content based on race or gender. And so what we found is that young people overall um, are exposed to, 30% 30, 30 of them are exposed to, well, 30% of the time they are exposed to negative content that relates to their race. 25% of the time they are exposed to negative content about gender. And so for me, that says it's there, and we need to figure out how to help our young people deal with it. One of the things that we also looked at is when you look at it for parents, 
you also see that, that same, those same n numbers. It's a bit higher for mothers than for fathers. Wow. As, as similarly, it's a bit higher for girls than it is for boys. And my, my um, explanation is that sometimes boys and men, we're just clueless. You know, some of the stuff, especially around gender, we don't, we don't see it as offensive and, or we're so used to it. Um, and so one of the things I think we need to really spend some time on is to really think about how young people are, ex how much content, negative content, young people are exposed to. On June 8th, 2015, I was sitting down having dinner with my, with my daughter, and we're watching the news. The news showed, one, the, the uh, escaped convicts in New York broke out. Um, there was an officer indicted in, in South Carolina for killing an unarmed uh, black man. And then there was uh, the uh, incident in McKinney, Texas, where a young black girl was taken down or thrown to the ground. And my daughter, I could see her visibly shaken, right? And then she hands me the permission slip of the school asking if she can see glory. Okay, so here's the thing I have to do as a parent. I have to understand all three sectors of where she resides and understand how, when, and how much content should she be exposed to. Because in this world, it's 24 seven. And we have gotten used to seeing some pretty heinous things on TV and on the web. And we just see it and we just go to the next thing. But we have to understand that young people are seeing it over and over and over and over. And so I think as we move forward, we need to pay special attention to that, especially as it relates to social and emotional learning. Yeah, no, and I mean, I, not to plug, but I just put out a blog today about the fact that we have, you know, uh, generated algorithms and others that may produce bias. So if you're a kid that looks at particular content or of a woman that looks at particular right. content, at some point the, the algorithm becomes adaptive. Right. <laughs> And that's all it feeds you because it's actually identified who you are and what you know your interest is and your interest and tastes and likes. And sometimes it's not all good. Right. You do a search. Sit down and do a search. Do, put black women in. No. Right. No. Right. And so to think that my daughter is trying to do a search and she puts in black women or black girls and you see what comes up, it's ugly. Yeah. Or black men. It's ugly, and so we have to understand that it's out there and, and not act like, oh, well, it'll be okay, or you, you're too sensitive. No, children are exposed to this 24-7. Yeah, and that's why those of us that work on um, big data in particular are trying to figure out fairness and equity in algorithms, yeah. fairness and equity in, in how big data is managed. And I think here at Fossey, like figuring out how do we give people the right tools and hygiene to actually navigate the web in a safe way. And when you come across that type of content, to have the conversation about it, right? in a way that is constructive. Right. Because oftentimes you see a lot of that because it's a one-sided conversation. Just, you know, find yourself one day, I, I think there's a rule, if you go down by the sixth comment, somebody has said something repulsive, right? Even though it may have started out with, I like apples. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden it's something horrible. So I think, again, this is part of this economy that we have. You know, Kevin, I want to say, you know, not because I like you and I've known you since I was 12. <laughs> How old am I? <laughs> right, I'm, I'm not going to tell you all that, but I will never tell my age. But every Everybody should read this report. I am always excited by new empirical research that comes out by various scholars to actually talk about things that we don't know about. Um, and I think it's a good way to start the conversation, particularly for those of us that are interested in long-term policy of how to crack the code for niche audiences. So let's give Kevin a round of applause. Uh, Stephen. Let's get let's give me a round of applause because I ain't talk that much. <laughs> 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 <laughs>